Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Nanama, welcome to Baha'i Blogcast. I'm so excited to have you as a guest. Thank you. Now, I don't know a whole lot about you other than you are a kind of a infamous teacher uh, and empowerer of the youth in, uh, on the Navajo reservation and in, and in that area. But tell me a little bit about yourself. Can you bring us into your biography for those who don't know you? Were you born into the Baha'i faith? Yeah, let me um, do a little bit of an introduction um, and acknowledging um, those who have come before me and uh, acknowledging those who um, are being accompanied and will come after me. So I'll introduce myself in my language, in the Diné, the Navajo language, to all my relatives, Navajo people. We are the largest Native American tribe in the United States, so I'm hoping that um, this will reach their ears. Shema e Charlotte Khan will ya shija e John Fogut will ya Shema sana e Annie Khan will ya shij e Chester Khan will ya look at your guy she ya ho at ma itwa de a cash heck e hashed e ma itwa de niche hashne a yeah niha had kiss so kai go that it's ill Doing it in a shlinagi, eh? Toy here, gleaning a shlin. Touch it me, eh? Bushes chin, bit at me, dash a chain. The Lagana, eh? Dash a nulla. So I just acknowledged um, who I am, my clanship system. So uh, Navajo people are a matriarchal society. So we, we pass down the mother's uh, clan. And um, I belong to where the two rivers flow together. And uh, that's my mother's. My father is the red running into the water clan. My grandfather is from this community of Hauk and Pine Springs, where I pr- primarily um, provide my services to the young people of Hauk and Sanders. And my grandfather is the Folded Arms clan. And I also introduced my two grandparents, who are both deceased at this, uh, are both deceased, um, Annie and Chester Khan. And then I introduced my father's father, who is, I said, um, Anglo, but they're really um, French, German, Canadian background. And I also, in my language, I was able to say where I grew up in the community of Likachukai, which is about 100 miles um, from where I'm currently serving, uh, where I'm living now, which is Hauk, and that I am speaking to you all now from Hauk, Arizona, along the southern part of the Navajo Nation. And I thank you all for coming to participate and listen. And uh, also, I want to acknowledge all my relatives um, in the sacred circle, the sacred hoop. And so um, as an indigenous Baha'i, I recognize that we are all one. So to say to all my relatives is an all-encompassing um, phrase that we say in our prayer hogan with the young people. If we, if we don't desire to say a, a prayer from our heart or from a prayer book or, or even interfaith session, we say um, to all my relations and we acknowledge our place in the circle, acknowledging the elders, our peers, those younger than us, and then also our place in the universe and the delicate balance that is required of our, our um, spiritual nature to recognize our role in, in what the delicacy of the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the mineral kingdom, and how we are in, in care of our mother earth as well as the reciprocal relationship of our environment that protects us and blesses us. And so in that way, I'd like to say thank you, Rain, and um, to all of the relatives um, listening to this uh, conversation as I introduce myself. I am a uh, fourth generation Baha'i. So in the 1963, um, the Navajo people held a council fire in Pine Springs, the historical moment where we saw the beginnings of entry by troops of our relatives here on the Navajo Nation. And um, so with that, my grandparents, Annie and uh, uh, Chester Khan, actually, his parents declared recognizing the Bob and Baha'u'llah as the return spiritual warriors 
of our um, cultural history, our oral history, and the return with sacred teachings. Wow, that's wonderful. I have to say, I've done, I don't know, 40 or 50 of these podcasts. You win. That was the best <laughs> introduction, prayer, sacred uh, beginning of a conversation I've ever had. That was so beautiful and um, really profound. Can you speak a little bit more? Because a lot of our audience is international. We have listeners in Europe and South America and Africa. There's pioneers that listen to this podcast. So, And a lot of people are not familiar with Navajo, and I love that that introduction. But I was just uh, thinking the importance spiritually um, from from the Navajo people and the indigenous native people of North America of acknowledging ancestors and bringing ancestors into the conversation. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, um, in all of our indigenous cultures, there's a recognition of where we are today due to the um, sacrifices and the endurance that it took from from um, even the dark world where it was just the critters and the bugs and the animals and this whole evolution and um, acknowledging the forbearance, the qualities that were needed to get us to this point. And um, some of our family programs, we focus on this phrase of our traditional Navajo prayer. Um, we say, beauty has been restored or it has become beauty again. And, and we also say um, beauty behind me. And to me that when we get older, we're referencing um, this acknowledgement of the past, even the genocide and the atrocities. Part of the healing is coming to a point where we can say the beauty, there is beauty behind me. And today we have come to restore that beauty. And then beauty before me, what is the vision that Baha'u'llah has given humanity for ways to go forward? Um, through his divine guidance. And then we say beauty above me and beauty below me. And again, that's recognizing all my relations that's because great. we're all preparing for this one year Baha'i plan. And I'm in a, in a little study circle group with, and we're studying the uh, covenant of Baha'u'llah by Adib Tahir's day. And uh, in the introduction, it's, it mirrors so closely the um, substantial changes in the revised book one right now. And I'm like, wow. Um, anyway, it talks about um, the main progress in this world is due to the concourse on high and, and being an indigenous Baha'i, I'm like, ah, of course, we, we know this. We understand this concept, this idea that really it's just a thin veil that separates this material plane and the, the, the worlds of God. And so we know that our progress as humanity, as indigenous people, have this understanding that that we're not alone. We're not the sole um, you know, progress in this world. It, it comes from the next world and the divine teachers and those ancient, ancient souls that have come before us. And that's even the woven in conversations that I have today, yesterday, last week with the families in our community when we experience the loss of a loved one. And um, many of the families think about their religion in that way. And you can hear it in, in their conversations saying goodbye to their loved ones, even over Zoom. They're acknowledging the ancestors who are acknowledging um, that the progress of the soul is um, continues and, and that the, the progress of our success in this world, we can't, we can't be achieved without the concourse and our ancestors calling on them. And it's such a powerful thing to know the names of those who passed because eventually our names may be forgotten and will be called on in the next world. And so the power of naming those ancestors that we know who have, who have you know, um, silently suffered, um, people of color, you know, they're there. And uh, yeah. when we go, so it's just a beautiful thing to, to weave into mm. um, when we think about our ancestors and, and the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation um, just gives more proof and comfort and solace to aching hearts that are in need of, of their own healing process when we think about our ancestors and calling them to mind and calling them to the fore in our Indigenous gatherings. That's such a beautiful way of looking at it, and uh, it's just profound because I hadn't really thought about that before. 
the native phrase of all my relations or just being in this hoop of life that we're all connected, we're all related, not only humans, but to, you know, like you said, the animals and plant kingdoms and mineral kingdoms, and then calling on the ancestors, how it's all so spiritually connected. It's, it's so integral to so many of the native faith traditions from what I know, and I know very, very little, by the way. Um, and it is so completely in conjunction with the Baha'i teachings. You know, my father passed away earlier this year, and so I did a lot of reading and studying about the the human soul and the progress of the soul. And there, you're right, there are countless quotes about calling on the concourse on high, how the souls, the pure souls that have departed are the leaven for this world. They provide the inspiration of the arts. They provide the inspiration for the sciences and the and the progress technologically, materially, mm-hmm. but also certainly, most importantly, spiritually. And as far as the teaching work and the work we do as Baha'is, like that's a it's a power, it's an energy that's just there waiting to be summoned, waiting to be connected with, you know, and and in my you know, this is a little weird to talk about on on a podcast, but I've been praying. I won't say praying to my father. I have been communing through prayer mm. with my father on the other side, and I know that uh, there's a tremendous power in prayer, and that his soul is longing to be called to help. You know, mm-hmm. on this side, he was a great Baha'i teacher. He taught. Dozens and dozens of people, the Baha'i faith. He served his whole life in the Baha'i community, and he would he would be honored to be connected with about you know the work here. Yes, I also pray to my my grandfather and my grandmother as well by name, um, especially because we live in a sig- historically significant population, and it requires that we know the integrative process that has existed here on this land for generations, you know? So it, um, yeah, I, when I get, I feel like I get stuck or paralyzed by my own shortcomings and my, even my, my lack of understanding of my own culture in some aspects, you know, I, I have to pause and realize the, the, the humble approach that it even takes within this community that I wasn't raised in, this is my grandfather's ancestral land when they came the, before the long walk and after the four years that the Navajo people were incarcerated in uh, Fort Sumner, New Mexico, and that 400 mile trek um, there and back. And so um, recognizing that even in this community, there are sacred stories and songs and traditional understanding that's kept um by this community and it varies across the whole 27,000 square miles of Navajo Nation. So my home community where where um, Annie Khan and their ancestral roots came from to back to that area has unique stories held with the land in conjunction with the land. Even in my introduction, talk about where the two rivers flow together. That's a physical place where the people first came and recognized one another, the spiritual um, nature of a human being, where we see one another. And there's many variations of Navajo clanship system that are all descriptive, describing the land and the people connected to it. And so calling on the ancestors by name, um, having a sincere land acknowledgement that this is native land, that we are on indigenous land, and, um, you know, that that it's not just a mere, um, you know, it's not a, it's not even a technical recipe. But if I could invite the Baha'is, you know, that we encourage this kind of um, self-introduction in the Navajo way, we, we extend our hand and we greet each other. And we're acknowledging that uh, we're, we're in this together, this special realm of reality, the physical existence. And we know that. Um, you know, any love attained in this world is a love in the next world. And so for us to greet each other that way in a circle, and it's very, it's, you know, we think about how the pandemic has altered the context in which we are doing that now. And we see that that is a vital strength in our communities. And when we cannot introduce ourselves or or we're not able um, to you know, be in person, how do we um, connect the hearts in that way and have a heart conversation about 
the many discourses, you know, um, uh, that are being had right now. And uh, it's been a struggle for our Navajo people to have this mm. connection, this initial where you come from and where I come from and where we meet together and shake hands. Um, you know, it, mm. it's it's been clear that 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 carries on the Navajo people because we're prayerful people and Indigenous people are prayerful people. And so it's been slightly you know, interesting not to have that part of our culture, um, but to trust that um, when we are even meeting new faces day to day, we just met a new face um, the other day, uh, my neighbor and I, we have a COVID relief route and we were taking things on Christmas day to an elderly couple. And, you know, this, this is the first time I was meeting them. So I had to, what is your posture like? Your, your prayer, your hands, your, 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 your nod, your listening, uh, making eye contact with our elderly people is still um, often very seen as not respectful. So how do you embody the spirit of Abdul Baha, you know, in the constructive mm. way that he acknowledged people and he would acknowledge people with silence first and silence is like the first line of defense for indigenous people because we're going to watch, we're going to observe, we're going to listen. How does one introduce themselves? How do we acknowledge where we are in this world? And, and that's, you know, I think that's a very simple part of our introduction that I want to invite the Baha'is listening and um, anyone listening to consider mm. our introduction. And in Navajo way, we always take the time to introduce, even if it's a large meeting, um, people will state mm -hmm. their purpose. And, and that's something mm, that's um, mm. I'm finding to be very um, key in the process. And as a young person, sometimes we often say, oh, I don't know about introducing myself in Navajo. I don't know about my culture. Everybody knows me in this circle. But I, I do observe from my elders that the introduction and acknowledgement, um, even if we know everybody already, <laughs> that that is a, stating your purpose is who I am um, in this world. And my beliefs are woven into who I am and and so I was taught to say Baha'i Nishle, I am Baha'i um, to my elders. And uh, of course, it's a great way to teach if people don't know what that is, um, the faith. Oh, that's wonderful. Could you imagine if all the Baha'is, <laughs> when they met someone, said, uh, I'm a Baha'i as part of their introduction, as part of their intention? Mm. Um, that's fantastic. No, I was thinking about this the other day because... Uh, my house sits on the native Chumash lands of sou Southern California, just north of L.A., and the Chumash lived on the Channel Islands, which I can see from my front lawn down in the ocean. And uh, mostly they lived there, from what I understand, in my limited understanding, cause to escape the fires which would ravage this area. And then they would canoe out at very young ages, the whole tribe canoe out and seasonally stay here and and harvest and hunt here yeah. and different areas of this land had different uh, fruits and vegetables that they would harvest to bring back um, and we were just going on a dog walk the other day up in the on the hills in the Santa Monica Mountains and there's a whole sacred area of the Chumash and sacred mountains which of course I know nothing about Zippo. But it behooves me to learn about this land that um, where every nook and cranny was sacred and had a purpose to its original inhabitants, which were, of course, driven off and, and killed in white history here. So that's a, that's a great reminder. That's a great reminder. But tell us about your, you said you didn't grow up there in the Hauk area. Where did you grow up? And tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up as a fourth generation Baha'i and what that was like and what your studies were, what your interests were, what your challenges were. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I grew up and it's called Lukach Ekai and it's, it's describing a valley and it's describing the tall reeds that, that used to grow in that valley in abundance. And those tall reeds um, make the Navajo basket. Uh, which is the ceremonial wedding basket. It's kind of closer to the heart of the Navajo Nation. And I grew up with very strong women, aunties, mother, grandmother. And uh, my grandmother, Annie, um, 
she sought to apply Baha'u'llah's teachings to the spiritual and social dimension. So she was an activist and advocate for, for women's um, uh, support and healing and help and um, was an advocate actually for Navajo children to be adopted first within the tribe. And they held some of the first conferences for, for women and children on the Navajo Nation um, in, the, in the 60s. And her inspiration by the principles of the Baha'i faith really afforded her to, to begin seeking like-minded people on the Navajo Nation in that way. And so um, I grew up with her. I would spend weekends with her. And she would be late at night, the sun would go down and we'd all be in bed along with the sun. And she would chant and whisper in my ear, she would chant 95 allow pause, she would chant the remover of difficulties. And um, sometimes I'd wake up early in the morning and she'd be there at 4am and dawn and she would be reciting some of the Baha'i prayers and she taught me how to make home visits that are culturally appropriate uh, the kinds that the elders are seeking and the kind that they're praying for without cell phone or any kind of communication, just the spiritual communication, um, coming to a home. And, and on many occasions, I witnessed the home visitor, that us, and then the, the one reciprocating the visit would say, I prayed for you. I knew you were coming today. I put on some coffee and I made some bread. And I'm just sitting there like, wow. And the journey it took to get to some of these homes high against the Likachikai red cliffs. You know, it, we'd be going down grandma's truck and it'd be all over the place. And we're, you know, making our own road at times. And then the road's getting, the dirt road's getting narrower and narrower and narrower until it's just a high center and two, you know, two paths for the wheels. And I'm just like asking grandma, looking at her, is this really going someplace? How do you know someone lives at the end of this, um, this trail? And sure mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. you know, there would be somebody waiting for our, our visit. And my grandmother would always bring goods, coffee, flour, um, even meat and warm socks and, and things of that. Uh, supplies like that so it's not a very different mm. reality than the one i'm experiencing right now with in in light of the pandemic um yeah. and so i grew up that way on weekends with my my grandmother and my cousins and siblings and um i'd also wake up in the morning where i'd watch my mother doing her obligatory prayer and uh, we don't have running water we grew up without running water um somewhere in 1995 our little log happened um, we got electricity and my father and my mother and us kids, I have two other siblings, Adesba and James, and we'd all go up to the mountains and haul the logs back to build our cabin. And our cabin grew over the years as we were able to acquire a truck and chainsaw and um, we would strip the logs and they're seasonally. So you have to dry, bring them down from the mountain, let them dry, rotate them so they don't become bowed and, um, and then strip the bark off and then work with them the following summer, you know, when they're ready and they're light, light logs and um, became that that was my childhood. I, my siblings and I would walk down the road to my grandmother's home. Angela and look at Chukai and haul water. First, we would start off with a gallon each. Um, my sister and I would take a, a gallon of water in each hand. We eventually grew to holding two gallons of milk jugs, you know, of water and two on each side. Mm -hmm. So then we're carrying four gallons. Eventually, we got a wagon and we we're hauling down, you know, um, probably eight to 12 jugs of water. You know, and then, wow. <laughs> so now it's actually not quite safe to, to walk in our community of look at but my father was one of my first animators who really um, has such dynamism and energy for engaging middle school students. And that was the age that we were really coming into our understanding of what it meant to be a Navajo person on, on the reservation. And it wasn't until middle school, as we know in the junior youth program, that we start asking these philosophical questions. Who am I? What's my purpose? What are we doing? You know, and I realized like, mom, my friend's you know, at school, don't pray. They don't know Baha'u'llah. They don't know Abdul Baha. And um, why? I thought that this was common knowledge. And my that's when my mother said, well, we're raising you as Baha'is. And I didn't know there was um, that, that I wasn't raised with that dichotomy of the, an expression of who we are 
and then religion as something separate. Um, there was a video that mm. uh, maybe we'll share. It explains that in our Navajo culture and language, there's no word for religion because it's an everyday expression of who we are and our beliefs are put into practice. Um, and and that that's part of, I think, um, the knowledge that I think about when um, educated Indigenous people will be so enlightened as to illuminate the whole world. And that's maybe part of an understanding that's being kept sacred. Um, prayer and that work is worship and service is worship. And my father taught us um, through resiliency and hard work, that's that self-discipline to go and act and not just wait and sit. And even today, not just study our life away, um, but to accompany it with service and study in this vital relationship for um, adolescence. And that still drives me today. And so you see, um, and we've had different various Baha'i community um, stages in Likachukai. At one point we had an assembly, mm -hmm. mostly relatives, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, my aunties live there. And uh, uh, so I, I grew up knowing both and my grandmother ensured that there was no fragmentation in our understanding of our cultural ceremony, which we would, um, all the cousins, we would come for family ceremony on weekends and they often start at 11 o'clock at night. So we'd be in bed early and at 11, we'd, we're all prepared to walk the, the distance from the home to the Hogan, which is the, the traditional dwelling place of the Navajo people, the Hogan where our ceremonies take place. And we'd sit up all night and mm -hmm. chant and pray and um, be be selfless in that process, even though we were tired and maybe we had to slouch or lean and we couldn't. And so um, those were the ways that my grandmother said, if there's going to be a ceremony that that's going to be preserved by Navajo Baha'is, it's going to be the blessing way ceremony, the Huizhonja, because it's focused on the beauty way, the integrative way. And as I mentioned earlier, mm. the ending of our Navajo prayers is Huizhona Haskli, we say that four times, and it means beauty has been restored. And as a Navajo Baha'i, mm. we know that that beauty, capital B, is the ancient beauty, the everlasting beauty, mm. the beauty of the blessed Abha. The Baha'u'llah is the ancient beauty, and we're invoking that ancient name, the blessed beauty. And my grandmother ensured, without telling us explicitly, everything is implicit, because to be an Indigenous person, you're always observing. You're taught to just watch and listen. Use all your senses and your outer faculties, because they're going to guide your inner faculties. Um, and so we would reflect she would build in the reflection after ceremony. What did you see? What did you hear? Um, what are the things that you had questions about? Maybe there was a way you had to walk into the Hogan. There was a way that you were supposed to turn and acknowledge the sun. And if you turn the other way, everyone's like, ah, 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 stop, stop, stop. You're turning the wrong way. And you have to like literally like <laughs> back up <laughs> um, to ensure that we were doing it in a way that reflected um, the universe's motion, which is cyclical. You know, um, yeah. right? Wow, that's just that's just fantastic. You know, I I'm very close with my uncle, Dr. Rhett Diesner, um, who lives in Idaho, and his whole field of study is the psychology of beauty. And he's a Baha'i, and in our conversations, realizing that perhaps the best way to understand the Creator is through the word beauty. We think of God as you know, in the in the Western civilization context of like the judgmental father figure on the cloud watching down on people, kind of similar to Santa Claus, and and Rhett's whole thing is like maybe it's you know the blessed beauty, the ancient beauty, but that God is is to understand God as beauty as as a kind of like a an integrated concept rather than a being. Um, is um, perhaps the next stage in an evolution of seeking to understand the ununderstandable. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that um, uh, in the Four Valleys, there's uh, the mystic knower and the grammarian. And, I, um, and so seeking beauty, sometimes you just have to jump into the ocean, you know, and, and there was that mm. example of the grammarian saying, I can't, I must 
to, to paraphrase probably very poorly, I can, I must know first, I must write, you know, I must in, intellectually understand. And I think a characteristic of seeking, you know, is to lose yourself in, in that process of like, I'm just going to dive into the ocean right now because that's the mm. integrated holistic mm. beauty. And we desire that. Actually, we focus one of our family programs here in the community around this concept for about two and a half years of beauty. And the families told us how they wanted to be thinking about beauty. And, and um, although there's this understanding that I was raised with, it was just facilitating a series of questions that allowed the population to feel safe to, to share in this community what sacred knowledge they were holding on to in terms of um, restoring beauty. And and especially the mothers here um, wanted to proceed with saying, we don't need to talk about the atrocities. We don't need to talk about and name these, um, you know, the people who caused genocide. We know it. And I and I thought, you know, because there's there's a theme in our discourse is to name um, the 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 monster in our in our culture is to name it, acknowledge it, but also. Um, these families and mothers didn't particularly want to do that. They said, we already know about that. We were taught that history in middle school. What we don't know is our own history in terms of um, who's telling the indigenous story and where those have gone. And it was such a beautiful, constructive approach that um, the families wanted to take. And, and we didn't ever have to really go back um, and recall the, the ugliness because these families in their own way before coming to the faith had recognized um, that the beauty has been restored behind us because we evoke this ancient beauty. And when they told us that, oh, the ancient beauty is Baha'u'llah and the Bab during the 27 bicentennial celebrations, they held a tremendous mm. um, cultural cake making process to uh, honor the birth of Baha'u'llah in 2017. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Wow, that's just just absolutely fascinating. But let's let's continue on a little bit more in your story. So that's that's you've painted quite a picture there with the with the logs and the chainsaws oh, yeah. and the hauling of water and and whatnot. What was what was your education like then and um where did your life take yeah, you? Yeah, so we went to like local um, school. We would catch the bus at 6 a.m. The first round, we live right next to our bus driver. It was a two-hour bus ride. We get to school at, you know, about 7.45, um, Saley Public Elementary School, which is about um, 15 miles from Likachukai. And um, uh, so I had, you know, a, a decent, I guess, primary education um, went to high school at a college preparatory school um, in a border town um, of Farmington, New Mexico. You know, even uh, my sister and I, in 2002, we were engaged at the first um, indigenous um, it, Ruhi intensive in Wakpala with Kevin Locke and um, um, some of my mentors, Kevin and George Holly and Mary Gubatayo and um, some of the, the coordinators had come from Colombia. And this was the first time that we indigenous effort um, intensive over six weeks had been um, had been, uh, I guess, initiated. So my sister and I and a cousin from Pine Springs, um, I think five Navajo youth, we all went together. But I had been yearning for the spiritual education of the Baha'i faith because being um, young, young Navajo Baha'i family would travel 100 miles all the way to the Native American Baha'i Institute to get some exposure to kind of a slightly larger Baha'i community, mostly made up of pioneers um, teaching on the reservation at that time. It may have been 20 de two decades. And then at this point now, some of the pioneers have been here um, you know, 40 years, 50 years, and uh, even have laid wow. to rest their loved ones here on Navajo Nation. Um, so um, 2002, I remember doing the first course and the first few quotations, I was on fire. I was, you know, lit. I was like ready to move and go. I was streaming tears. Like we have to do something about the conditions of our, of our nation. And I remember my Ruhi tutor, <laughs> just the first few, few quotes was like, We'll get there. Don't worry. It's like only the first day of six <laughs> weeks, you know. Um, I was, I think I was 15, almost 16 at that time. Um, and then we went back to my sister and I. Uh, we went back to our, our school as sophomores and started a book one in our dorm room um, with one of her my sister's friends. And um, every summer I would dedicate 
my sister and I would dedicate our services to um, to the community of this community where Nabi is. And immediately, I think I was listening to your talk yesterday at, uh, for the Grand Canyon Conference about empowering youth. And, you know, two things you mentioned for our, you know, the older generations is one is to kind of move aside, <laughs> step aside, and then mm-hmm. to learn ab- about empowering young people. And that was something um, my mother worked at Nabi. Um, All those summers as I was going through junior high and high school and would come back um, post-2003 and still dedicate summers um, to um, coordinating the youth program. But early on, the administrators at the Baha'i Institute in that time, 2002, um, and, you know, the next decade was really allowing the Navajo youth to take ownership and lead that process. And of course, we were just 15, 16, 17 years old. And we we were, you know, kind of mirroring, not so confident in our own indigenous approach, but we were mirroring what we had experienced in Wakpala in 2002. And um, strive to have um, youth campaigns um, that following summer that would engage and, and invite some maybe 10 to 12 uh, Lakota youth from the Wakpala Nation that we had met the previous summer in our outreach, doing the accompanying practices mm. to the Institute courses. But that was really strong in my, in allowing me to be the protagonist in who I am. And I remember that first summer, 2003, when we came back and we were creating a two week intensive and we had no idea what we were doing, but I remember about halfway through, I mean, there was um, <laughs> native youth on, on rooftops and, um, we're getting news of um, their loved ones in the Wakpala reservation who had committed suicide. And I remember one night, some of the Lakota youth just ran off campus in the dark and we were having starting to say 500 or remover of difficulties while the adults went out. And um, so you can, you can sense the upbringing that, uh, and opportunities that we had to pray. And I remember my sister and I, we gave up at one point in the two week camp and just had to go to the prayer hogan and just say the tablet of Ahmad. And that was the first time that I myself as a young person had actually relied on prayer in a way that I'm just mm. like detachment, throw your hands up. It is what it is. And we emerged um, with a, a new understanding of like, okay, this is where we are. This is not Wakpala. This is not, you know, with our veteran deepened indigenous Baha'is, you know, um, this is a youth mm. initiative. And and since then that's um, characterized my approach um, at, at like the foundational level is to turn to prayer and I'll try to strive to be in a state of prayer. And so that's, I, I did some years, um, I also was reflecting yesterday, you shared that some 10 years or 11 years or so, you know, you had maybe um, not been as active in the Baha'i faith. And I did the same thing. I, you know, with Mm -hmm. our family being kind of prominent, the Khan name being kind of a prominent name since the 60s till till now. Mm -hmm. And it's actually kind of a sore spot to talk about the influence that sometimes a name can give and, uh, so my my sisters and my siblings and I, we strive really hard actually not to promote that name because people will romanticize and glorify it. And then it becomes an invitation to say their story from the 60s, you know, which is fine. But it actually that happens so often that it takes up so much of the youth's time when our elders are involved and want to storytell and share anecdotes, which, you know, we deeply respect our elders. And especially in this time of the pandemic, we want to pre- take care of them and protect them. And so honoring them and thinking about how I've treated my elders in our Baha'i spaces, you know, always creating time for them to listen and to strive to hear their intended meaning. Um, uh, because th- sometimes the story may not feel like it's connected at the outset. You know, what did we just spend 20 minutes talking about? Um, <laughs> you know, and then you have to really mm. hear the, the nuggets, the gems of wisdom, because it does connect to the overall conversation or consultation being had. Um, so, I spent mm-hmm. 10 years in Albuquerque. Um, I did two years of college at UNM. Um, one thing I do regret is really pursuing my education um, uni- at the university level. But I think all of those things led to where I am today because I think the work in this community, if I, I don't know if the youth would respond to me if I had um, a degree or uh, I think in my path, I always really just yearned for justice at the grassroots. Um, And Mm. so that's where I am right now. And Mm. uh, people ask me, Mm -hmm. so where'd you go to school? And I just said, I did it. 
you know, pursue a higher education. I, that's, I didn't mm-hmm. do that. My name is means Nanaba, the one who went to battle and to war and came back to tell of it. And so I'm thinking, well, I went to um, East Valley Learning Sites and I came back to describe the experience and try to rally and advance understanding and mobilize the youth. Or I went, um, left the reservation because I was a junior youth. I did not want to live on the reservation. I was a junior youth that said, um. I, I don't like not having running water and electricity. It was just a hard life. And I, I yearned for like, okay, I'm, once I get out of high school, I'm going to. And Navajo Prep in Farmington was a place where um, we stayed in dorms. So for four years, I rarely came home. I just dove into athletic life on weekends and stayed with the team Mm. because I love cooperative. And um, my my senior year, um, I got- What sports? Volleyball and softball mainly. Yeah. And for volleyball, I got an award for my senior year, um, something like the most most inspirational leader. And I thought- you know, I still didn't see that as a strength. You know, I thought, oh, you know, mm. great, that's it, you know. But um, now I think back and it was such an honor to know that uh, those Baha'i qualities were being applied at the team level. And we had so much fun mm. anyway. So I've been kind of all over the four mm. corners. I lived one year in California when I was first married, um, our first year of marriage with my husband, and um, came back to the res because that's my name, the one who came back. And, I remember before my grandmother passed, she said, you're living your name. And of course, I'm like, oh, grandmother's wisdom. Tell me how I'm doing that. And she was like, no, you tell me how you're doing that. And I thought, well, Uh. I'm, you know, I have retail, uh, eight years of retail management experience and working with teams of people, especially college students. I worked Mm -hmm. at Victoria's Secret and we did the store opening in Albuquerque for Sephora. And so like these, you know, multi-million dollar enterprises. And um, Mm -hmm. I always excelled in building the team and winning our goals, our financial goals. (laughs) And then what would always connect me back was my name. And I would pray even when my grandmother was alive, I would pray, you know, grandma, you know, c- come visit me in my dreams and tell me what to do because it, it did mm. feel empty, right? Selling material mm. goods and telling, you know, yeah. this other perception of beauty, which is external and physical. Um, but I would have dreams in my, in my store where it, there would be cobwebs on the product shelves and the products would be empty. And I'm sitting there like, this is not what I want to be selling, what I want to be doing. So um, when I was pregnant with my first son, my husband and I took that opportunity to to start new and move back to the reservation. And we lived with my grandmother and and she was, you know, quietly guiding me implicitly um, on these Mm. visits and um, considering our culture and the Baha'i faith. And um, anyway, yeah, that's kind of so. So you came back to tell. Yeah, I came back to tell. <laughs> that's that's beautiful. Can and for those um for the people listening that don't know anything about it and I know very little about it. Can you tell us about NABI, the sure. Native American Baha'i Institute? Yeah, so um my understanding of of NABI, uh it kind of emerged from the grassroots of vision where can we pra- where can we learn about our culture and the Baha'i faith. And so that's the original Mm. vision of we need a place to come to, to call our own, where we can investigate both as one reality. And that began with the vision of 1962 and the mass teaching and that happened here in the community of Pine Springs and conversations pursued with um, National Spiritual Assembly and, uh, again, Shogi Effendi's guidance from the 40s, urging Native American communities to have all Indigenous assemblies and um, and a place where consolidation work can be the focus of future generations. Mm. Um, and so sometime in the 80s, um, there had already been established a few buildings and I was born in 85. So uh, um, I would come, you know, sometime in the early nineties with my mom and my, like I said, my mom eventually worked there as program coordinator as children's class coordinator, but it's a beautiful 40 acres. And um, uh, the community consulted the young men of that time um, was my grandfather, Chester Kahn and some of his relatives and, I would participate in the programs there. And as a young person, I recalled all the buildings already being there 
um, a classroom, an office space, a, a dining hall, a small kitchen, an outdoor mm-hmm. shade house for the summer activities. It included outhouses, um, uh, even though there is indoor plumbing, um, the outhouses served for the large gatherings that would take place. And then a small residential mm-hmm. area, which is still made up of um, trailers. And the vision is to continue to um, make more permanent lodging and buildings there um, uh, and not just trailer for uh, the residential housing. Nabi has undergone a various transition and changes, even including Navajo administrators or um, uh, interracial marriage with at least one spouse who was an administrator. So it's always had, I think, the Navajo people in mind and had done fits and starts in terms of the kinds of um, portals that would be created to allow entry by troops. And we're still um, at this time struggling to understand the, the instrument of limitless potentiality as the primary instrument to which we will raise and mobilize the youth and um, identify local indigenous human resources to this land that are committed and won't ever move or aren't transient. Um, so Nabi is just a beautiful place, uh, 7,000 feet in elevation. Um, it also includes on its property um, sidewalks and a softball field and playground equipment. And in 2006, the National Spiritual Assembly supported the extension of a a brand of new and bigger kitchen. And so um, with the love and support of the NSA, there's been much physical developments with the property. And then... um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Thanks for filling us in on, on Nabi. And that's a natural segue going back to the work you're doing right now with the youth. I've heard so many incredible stories, and you sent that beautiful video that hopefully will get posted on Baha'i blog, maybe related to this podcast, about the work that you've been doing with the youth, empowering youth, the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program, and service projects. Can you just tell us about that work? Yeah, the... The Junior Spiritual Empowerment Program in this cluster of Fort Defiance, which actually the population of this cluster is about 50 to 55,000 um, individuals, and it's rural. So everything related to the guidance from the house in terms of a village setting, um, we we focus in on keenly and how that guidance based on years of generating experience, we you know are applying that here. And the junior youth program began in 2007 here with um, a couple local volunteers, Navajo um, youth. And um, then I came in 2010 and kind of picked up the reins from, um, you know, one local junior youth group in a pocket called Carino. And there was 12 junior youth. And um, it was very systematic from the youth volunteers and the ways that I was getting to know this community right from the get go. I'm applying my mother's uh, uh, what's culturally appropriate to visit, to you know, relying on that, um, and uh, the the mode of for some of the transient volunteers coming to Nabi, which have really sustained the energy and the the last probably 15 years of what it means to be a Baha'i youth. We've turned to those key volunteers, especially the ones who were um, outward looking in their orientation to go out of their way and know their purpose as to why they're serving at the Baha'i Institute amongst Navajo people is to truly befriend them. But then after that, deeply connect them to a process of transformation. And that second step is still, we're still trying to widely disseminate that knowledge within the junior youth program. And so in 2010, I I was handed 12 junior youth from one pocket and started um, dedicating what um, I was actually invited um, by the Nabi administrators to apply for the youth coordinator. And um, I had met some friends in East Valley during that time. And and, uh, I was invited to the learning site in East Valley for the dissemination of the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program. And I remember I was like, I'm hired at Navi to work with youth. This kind of like narrow minded understanding because I'd coming from retail management and I worked well with college students because they're close to my age and, you know, building a team in that way to achieve goals. And so uh, when I went, I found myself at a East Valley junior youth program 
a reflection space for two weeks for four years, two, two times a year for um, two weeks each. It, the first time I was like, I have to work with what age? Middle school kids? And I was like, nah, it's not, don't think I'm into that. I thought I was working with youth, <laughs> you know? Um, so we know that those go together now. But um, it attracted me so much because our twin heroes of our Navajo culture are were adolescent and they matured and they became the twin manifestations in our culture. And so the power of adolescence struck me. And then all of this remembering of my grandmother's teachings came back about this age group. Um, and so I remember taking Ruhi Book 5 for the first time, and I thought, this is filling in the gap, what I missed in my adolescent years. And I could actually recognize some of the elements, for example, my father as an animator and what he did to animate our ideas and to act them out to practice service projects. Uh -huh. um, so. You know, the, our, can, can we just can we just pause yeah. one second? Going back, what's this about adolescent? Uh, um, oh, the twin uh, warriors, an adolescent duo of um, of holy people yeah. in the Navajo tradition. Sure. So, um, uh, the junior youth program really um, brings to life this uh, cultural oral stories of our of our twin warriors in the Navajo culture. We know of two adolescent brothers. And in the wintertime, we tell this story and it takes all winter to tell the story. And there's a, hmm. there's a PG-13 version <laughs> of this winter story. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's the adult version, which um, it includes uh, even like incest and adultery and things that people um, uh, at that time were, were being lost and confused in a world of darkness. And I take out elements of the story and connect it to the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program. And in our culture, um, the way we emerged into um, a new race of humans at that time, there were many monsters during the time of Changing Woman, who was the mother of these twin boys, brothers. Um, and they became adolescent and they approached their mother and said, who are we? What do we do? There are many monsters in this land from old age to giants to um, bird, giant birds, uh, giants eating and searching out for children, poverty monster. And so these boys had this philosophical desire to know how they can help restore the beauty to the land and the people. And through their questioning after four days, Changing Woman said, okay, everything is in four in this story. And Changing Woman said, well, let me tell you about who your father is, because that's one of your questions. So she told them, your father is the son. And um, he may have tools for you. And so these twin brothers, out of their yearning and desire to be, be constructive and contribute to change in their their communities saw this great darkness that was unfolding across the land and consuming the people and um, very much like today, disease was happening and, and the spread of um, um, it's just bad habits. So these twin boys took upon themselves, well, we're going to travel to the sun and we know that the council is, he may not um, recognize us as his children, but we will take a journey to acquire tools and teachings and so they went on this epic journey to the sun and all along the way they're being aided and supported by their relatives the animals um and and given chants and various tools and songs along the way and when they approached the housemate of dawn where their father lives they had to pass four tests and eventually the son recognized them as his children and um gave them things like the lightning bolt, the bow, and gave them new teachings to bring back to humanity and teachings that would restore balance and harmony and um, reinvigorate the beauty way. And when these twin warriors came home, they slayed monsters. And the bob is likened unto the one of the twin warriors whose name is Monster Slayer. Now, these stories are coming from our blessings and beauty uh, from our local relatives that have shared 
this profound meaning of how the Bob and Baha'u'llah are likened to these two twin warriors in our Navajo stories. And so the Bob is likened unto the monster slayer who had to, in the time, had to do, um, perform battle and, and had to use the means to protect the nascent teachings of, of the faith. And he slayed the monsters. And then the brother, who is the name in Navajo, is child born for water. And as a Navajo Baha'i, we recognize that that one is Baha'u'llah. And together they performed ceremony in slaying the monster and then bringing the healing waters at the same time. Um, so at, when something is being taken away, it's replaced with something beautiful. And that's how these two brothers work together, the Bob and Baha'u'llah, monster slayer and child born for water, and would bring the healing message. And together they performed this ceremony um, until the land and the people had come to balance and teachings were being spread. And um, then the son invited these twin warriors to live with him, and they invited the mother, um, changing woman, to live with them and go to the West to a special island. And we recognize in our Navajo culture today that that island where the um, this holy family went to live is a Hawaii. And so we see our relatives wow. there. Yeah. Mm, mm, and so mm. when I share this story with in the wintertime in the Hogan with our junior youth program and the camp attendees, um, we, we speak of this like power of adolescence and um, emerging mm. spiritual powers, the power of perception that we're molding and facilitating through the text and the power of observation, the power of eloquent speech and the capacities that contributing like these twin warriors in our culture went out into the community and had to do two things, had to teach a new way and then to practice it in light of our service to the community. And that, when you see that recognition in an indigenous Navajo youth, that I'm that adolescent, mm. I have the power to say, who am I? I don't know. It's okay to be in the safe space and say, I don't know who I am. I don't know my culture yeah. or my language, but something in that story relates to me today that I can, I can, I, even if I didn't have a primary, a good primary education or even a good secondary education, there's hope that this spiritual transformation will allow me to transcend what I what I don't think I've acquired in terms of what looks successful today. And that um, mm. we, we do this and junior youth in this area love to do service projects. And that's the whole story oh. of the program in this area. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of service projects are you guys engaging in or have you? Yeah. So they're very basic, but they're, you can see how they could get more complex. So the basic ones are like, let's visit grandma and grandpa and do some spring cleaning. Let's repair their pothole dirt roads. Let's repair um, cattle fences and feed cattle, including shearing sheep and rep um, junior youth picking up trash and then one group went even deeper um, into root causes of trash and to the people's hearts and minds and um, kind of a common reflection about the land and the trash is you know we're supposed to walk in beauty but how do we walk in beauty when the land is littered and so junior youth hear these things in their wider community from their parents and grandparents and they bring it to group and so we're able to say well you know beyond trash picking, what do you want to do? Because they're like, we just keep picking up trash. It's a year later, you know, so what can we do? And then they would take, go and home visit actually and, and share the quote by Shogi Effendi um, about uh, the human heart is inseparable from our environment and we cannot reform one without the other mm. and say that everything's going to be okay. Mm. But in fact, that we are organic with the world around us. And, and that's kind of intrinsic to you know, indigenous understanding of taking care of this uh, relationship with our mother earth and um, uh, wood hauling projects. And that's the one that actually um, came um, is growing in more complexity at the level of social action. Mm. So we would um, haul wood for our winter October camp and spring break camp and um, uh, go and make deliveries and after a year or two, the junior youth said, well, there's got to be a better way to reach more households instead of just the people that we know. And so um, uh, with various older youth arising and graduating the program, we would write letters to local businesses or local chapter house or write simple communication that would be distributed at the Thursday night community dinner 
hosted by Nobby. And on average, every week on Thursday, we would have about 30 elders and families coming to the space. And it was a great space for animators and junior youth to practice an idea mm. or to convey um, a project and get illicit community support and how when a group would go about accomplishing it. And eventually, um, maybe three or four years ago, the junior youth program, they wrote letters to people said, if you got your own truck and you have your own wood hauling per permit, meet us, we'll provide the labor in the spirit of service, selfless service. And at first we started with three cars that showed up. Um, we would also draw Nobby's truck and Nobby's flatbed trailer to load wood. And then the following year, we had like five to eight trucks come and the junior youth and youth animators would fill all these loads. We'd all caravan up to the mountains together. Mm -hmm. And um, it consultation to like looking on each side of the dirt road, where are we going to get the most wood for eight cars? And you want to try to get in at least one or two spots. Um, and of course, everything by the road that's easily accessible are the are the logs and trees that are harvested first. And it's always the dead ones. You don't ever cut live mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then we would learn, we would invite um, our elders and older youth um, to teach us how to make a prayer offering to, to the, to the tree or the forest. Uh -huh. And we would always have a, a orientation around safety and the kind of selfless service that it can attract divine confirmation. Mm -hmm. And so we approach that um, like the twin warriors did. There's an individual level, there's the community level, then there's the institutional level community. And when you do the selfless service, it attracts and it restores beauty. Wow. Um, and we see the divine blessings and confirmation, which connect to the first text of the junior youth program, breezes of confirmation and making an effort and reflecting and seeing what the confirmations are. And the confirmations here are very visible um, the eagle, okay, the hummingbird. So many times we sat in a junior youth circle in the forest and then we were praying and then a, a hummingbird came right in the middle of our circle and went around clockwise and then zipped off. And the kids are like, is that confirmation? <laughs> I'm like, sure, there's a sign and attribute and quality in every living thing. And they, everything is pronouncing one of the name of God, mm. names of mm. God. So what do you think the hummingbird is? What is the owl? What is the stink bug? What is the snake? Mm. Um, what is this plant, you know, if we're harvesting the herbs? Mm -hmm. So you can see the heightened part of the junior I think, youth I think program. the stink bug is my totem animal. <laughs> I, I relate. Stink bugs are I good. relate to the stink bug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what a stink bug stink is, bugs. but <laughs> <laughs> they're a black beetle okay. and um, they they're used. Sometimes you can get sores in babies mouths mm. or in your mouth. And what you do is you just the stink bug will, I guess, have its stink or scent and you would apply it around the mouth. Mm -hmm. But also stink bugs repel with their scent. They repel snakes. Mm. And um, keep the snakes away. So once the kids learned of that, they were like, oh, we're not going to kill the stink bugs anymore. Mm. Um, so this whole process of knowing um, kind of like this balance of where we are, because, you know, out here, kids are kids, too. You know, they'll burn ants or they'll do something a little bit destructive to the land. And and in our culture, there's there's a repercussion. There's a uh, uh, what's the word? Consequence, Consequence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of those actions. And so the whole three-year program is really guided around um, this effort and then confirmation. And I, that's why I just love this program, junior mm, program. Mm. And, and I was able to put away my 25-year-old self. And what I thought I was coming to Navi for was to be a youth coordinator. Um, and then just finding this love, this story, and taking book five and my personal journey filled in all the gaps and misunderstandings that I had about me and my spiritual identity and my connection to my faith, and then the connection to the global endeavor of the Baha'i work, and constantly going, you know, from this local, humble, like, daily, let's go visit an elder and share a prayer. Let's go visit your grandmother and pick up trash, and let's go visit this family and... Um, um, haul wood for them. The House of Justice has described the approach of the junior youth program in terms of uh, opportunities afforded by personal circumstances. And so I've all, we've always met people where they are in this program, families, mm -hmm. the junior youth themselves, our connection with the school, our connection with the local chapter house, 
and knowing the personal circumstances, and then knowing how to tailor the conversation, meaningful and distinctive, to dictate the houses, how the local residents themselves begin this process of growth. And we're still there. Mm. We're, 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 for those listening, we're a milestone two cluster. So we're, we're about 32 core activities in the whole cluster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 19 of them are concentrated in this 30 mile radius surrounding the Baha'i Institute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was really key for adolescent kids as part of the framework for action is to read our reality. Mm. And we know that um, junior youth have a keen sense of justice. It's not fair. Yeah. You know, why? Yeah. Um, and so constantly creating space for them to express that mm. and, and discover and explore why things are the way they are mm. and not just regurgitate our hollow slogans that are wider in society's influence mm-hmm. on them, but also the elders' conversations and what, you know, drawing on what do our elders say about this community? Mm. Mm. Um, Wait, though, I, I've never heard this before. The the way that you are weaving in your reality, like you say, but culture and and background and environment uh, into the junior youth spiritual empowerment program is is truly profound, and it's really exciting. It's got it's got me thinking uh, a lot more about you know ways to weave the reality into the program so that it's not just this dry kind of book work. Because one of my issues with the Junior Spiritual Empowerment Program is the way it's taught a lot is just it's they go to school all day and then, hey, let's sit down with these books and study these books for another couple hours. But there needs to be sports and play and, like you said, storytelling, and most of all, service projects woven in that aren't just like, okay, we're going to do all this book work, and then we're going to collect some canned food for the food bank in an hour, and yeah. that's the service project. No, it's it has to be woven and integrated, and, and the way that you're doing that is is just really inspiring. It's exceptional. Yeah, I think from 2010 to 2013, you know, when we had the historical youth conferences around Mm -hmm. the world, those three years, I was just a full-time animator, striving to see what it would take to grow the program, but especially a company and and the true dynamics of empowering um, groups to to analyze the constructive and destructive forces operating in their society, but also my role, understanding my culture now, applying like, wow, this is what grandmother was teaching me this whole time and grandfather and mother and my dad. Like um, it just, it just happened to be that I was able to live my name and give myself to the program for three years. And it was the time that allowed these groups to, to flourish with that, with that nascent understanding of what is required of an animator, your commitment, your dedication to see a group for three years. And I, I, you know, being given the bounty, um, you know, I'm supported by the national spiritual assembly, um, through, and at times it's been through Nabi employee Mm -hmm. and now I'm serving as a resource person. So to be able to be given an opportunity to do this full time, Mm -hmm. Um, has really allowed this understanding to mature and grow. But I remember on some weekends, I'd be accompanied by resource persons from the learning site. Phoenix is like four and a half hours Mm -hmm. away, East Valley. Mm -hmm. And so they'd come out. And I remember my dear friend um, uh, came with me. We met, uh, we met up and I said, well, we're going to spend the whole day in the community. And, and we met in the morning and we did, we went to uh, the Carino pocket and um, that junior youth group grew to about 15 at mm-hmm. one point and we did home visits and I would pick them up in the Nobby car because that had, you know, space and and um, stay in walking distance of one sort of little pocket um, of housing, a cluster of housings and um, would play and do the study and do service right there in the whole day. And I remember at the end of the day, it was about sunset and we'd been out all day and, and we were my friend and I were reflecting. I said, OK, so what do we do tomorrow? And my my dear friend said, "Well, maybe tomorrow we can plan our lunch <laughs> and our schedule." <laughs> and I said, "Oh my goodness! I didn't realize we had no food all day long. It didn't even occur to me, you know." So that level of intensity—I I was 25, 
26, 27. But you see how book five, just the sections about youth, they're agile, their ability to respond to any local or national situation, their mm. vigor, their vitality, mm. that kind of selfless service, mm-hmm. you know, I go back to, and now I'm 35, about to be 36. And I don't have that level of energy. Now I have two boys, you know, who's just turned 11 and six. So I have to adjust what my coherent family service looks mm. like in the context of still striving to serve as an animator, but now with extra responsibility on my shoulders to help disseminate what's working in our communities to, um, get a basic program of 50 junior youth. And we've been struggling for 10 years, mm. both times in 2000, after the youth conferences, we were focused on youth right in the conversation. And maybe we let go a little bit about the focus on junior youth themselves in our efforts to raise up animators. Sometime in 2017, 2018, we realized it's junior youth and youth must go together. So we had to pick up the junior youth program again. And in terms of the outreach and youth conference conversations and materials and weave them together Mm, again. mm. Um, And so uh, right now, just before the pandemic, the expanding nucleus of committed friends for the core activities in this area, we were just beginning to plan the um, collectively the junior youth program Mm. camp in March. And um, so we, we see fits and starts of the junior youth program there's a small team of dedicated people, but sometimes our focus can be on, um, like I said, fits and starts of some of the programming and where we've let go of the junior youth program. Um, we saw very little growth in our community, but where we saw strengths of the junior youth program being applied to grow and reach out to mm. youth and then families, mm. we were able to, um, to see some growth and we're at 48 registered junior youth in our program right now. Oh, and wonderful. The pandemic has altered how we do the work now. And there's a few that are still in conversations through Facebook chat or texting. And um, one local animator, she'll text a quote from the textbook to them to inspire them daily. But the most, I think, intrinsic part about our culture is the service element. Mm. And that just comes so naturally to the mm. kids because survival of the families often depends on the youth themselves, Mm. Mm. even facing these formidable challenges of suicide, um, diabetes, health, the lack of good food. And so it's all very coherent. You have to have really dedicated souls. And currently I'm serving as a resource person within the context of rural village setting. Um, And I'm working with um, the East Valley Learning Site Mm. to learn about um, That's in the Phoenix area, as the, Mesa. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Really, to learn about when a population um, engages with the revelation and how we make it our own. So, there's been many questions over the years um, as to how families, two or three families, can come together and learn to hold conversations amongst them, mm-hmm. consultation, mm-hmm. and then how these two to three families say, would it reach out and invite other families? Mm-hmm. And we know it's intergenerational approach. Mm -hmm. Um, We've never gone beyond 50 junior youth because that kind of fourth protagonist um, is the families. Mm -hmm. And when families understand the program, they take it. So we've been trying to work with a few five to eight families now of the junior youth program. And after a decade of nurturing, um, consciously loving, um, supportive, reciprocal relationships Mm -hmm. with these five to eight families, you know, we're still trying to have the families see themselves as what elements are of this program mm. are going to reinforce their own home values. So that's the first conversations that lend itself to coherence of all elements of the junior program, service, recreation, study, and um, arts. Mm-hmm. From the very first conversations, we ask families, are there artistic expressions or what does the family yeah. do? And often they're like, wow, I used to make kachina dolls some decades ago. I don't do that anymore. I'm being invited to share with my grandkids. Mm. Don't you know people in the community that do that? I'm you know, like, no, that's why we're mm. here. Mm-hmm. And to have their own grandkids say, we want to know grandpa, or let's invite um, some of the local artists and let's celebrate them. And they can teach us how to do master beadwork or feather arrangements for ceremonial purposes. Mm or um, sand paintings, or silversmith Mm. art. And so Mm. you can see the power of adolescents reaching out to the next generation to implore them to generously share. And it's so empowering when adolescents do that with their elders. It's okay. It's in a good way. Mm. 
And um, we just kind of sit and observe and let the junior youth take the course as they want to. But it's all been a very difficult, you know, long and thorny road. Yeah. <laughs> We're still here. Yes, we've. I've just been working with this one junior youth now youth group for for many years. It's very small, but even that, it's it's a lot of work. It's very hard. It's it's treacherous. There's a lot of ups and downs, and good times and bad times. Um, so we should wrap it up. And I, I guess Nanaba, I, I leave it to you. Yeah. What would, how would you like to end this conversation? I mean, I've learned so much and uh, been inspired greatly by the way that you weave effortlessly your culture and heritage into the Baha'i work. And um, what would you like to leave the listener with? You know... Uh, you had mentioned a comment. Uh, is it okay to reference the Grand Canyon Conference? Sure, <laughs> we're teaching why not? You were sharing sure. that yesterday. Uh, for those listening, I did a little talk on empowering youth at the Grand Canyon Conference, which was streaming uh, this weekend. It's Christmas weekend, uh, 2020. And um, please go ahead and reference it. And we can, we can put the quote uh, down below in the, in the podcast as well. Yeah. So what you had shared was um, the, you said that mystic feeling, and that's the kind of approach that the junior youth program has been taking, is this spiritual dimension that's constantly here, and it's a part of the reality, and and that's a way to to touch the hearts, and I think I was reflecting with my sister about that comment yesterday, right after um your presentation, and we were thinking about how the heart, um, inviting everyone at the level of the heart to have these meaningful and distinctive conversations with the junior youth in your family, in your neighborhood. So for all the the friends listening to this, I want to invite you to think about um, how we engage junior youth and creating that the primary focus is to create an environment where um, these wonderfully powerful emerging spiritual talents of this age group can blossom and mature and for us to allow junior youth to make the mistakes. It's the only way we'll, we'll be able to learn even as humanity is likened unto emerging from the adolescent stage into maturity We have to allow this humble posture of learning to permeate that mistakes are okay. That's how we're going to reflect on them. And uh, the most successful um, parts of the program in this community where we saw growth, accelerated growth, was because we were allowed to make mistakes um, and refine them in that process. And, you know, I just want to even just quote the National Spiritual Assembly in closing when it, um, in, ta- in terms of race relations in the June 19th letter to our countrymen, it said the, ha- the NSA has said, we must build the capacity to truly hear and acknowledge the voices of those who have directly suffered from the effects of racism. And that can play a role coherently in the junior youth program all across the nation and across mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. And I thank you so much for sharing that. And I've I've heard some amazing stories coming where from out there where people have adapted the, the junior youth programs and even the Ruhi books into discussions of racism. So they're doing like a Ruhi book one with a focus on racism. So every quote and discussion kind of turns to racial injustice. Uh, in America and what we can do and eliminating prejudice and healing prejudice. And and these have been going great gangbusters, apparently, with um, creating, generating a lot of excitement and enthusiasm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we turn to Abdul Baha's example. Mm, beautiful. Is there a Navajo prayer that you could share with us in closing? Yes, yes. Um I'll sing one. It's not a Baha'i prayer, um, but it was created by um, a local Baha'i, Navajo Baha'i friend and and a pioneer who had her guitar. 
And this is, um, it's saying, the creator has embraced me in this love. And with beauty before me, I walk. With beauty behind me, I walk. With beauty above me, I walk. With beauty below me, I walk. It is all around me, and with beauty, I walk. So this is um, the phrase that I've been sharing um, during this this discussion mm -hmm. with you. And it's put to a Sanskrit melody. Oh, beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, so we can see a you know, blending of cultures. Mm. And it was inspired um, by uh, the beauty way, by Baha'u'llah's beauty way. <clears throat> Ah, <laughs> Big ego ho jong shik e jin na hasli ho jong go na sha do shit si jin ho jong go na sha do shik he din ho jong go na sha do shit de ye ho jong go na sha do she ya ke hu jong ko na sha do ta at so she na ko hu jong ko na sha do hu jong na has clean 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 Beautiful. Uh, yeah, it means thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I got so much out of this discussion, and I think the rest of the world will as well. All right. Well, the journey continues. We are we one. Are one. <laughs> thank you, Nanaba. Take care, Rain. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night.